So I'm focusing today on genomics and microbiology because this is the genomics part, but um, it's really, uh, what I put together was just to show you how much genomics and sequencing has really transformed microbiology. It's transformed everything, but it's really transformed evolution and uh, microbiology, and so I'm going to try to give you a perspective on that, and it kind of falls right in between the lesson that you just did and the lesson that you're going to do um, because we developed them together, basically. Okay, so microbiology basically kind of started here uh, with Hoke in 1676. And what he did was identify microorganisms, and you've heard about this as animalcules. Um, he had no idea what there were, but he was really impressed by them. He was actually testing plaque on his teeth, um, and he was testing plaque on other people's teeth too to see what was in there and what formed plaques um, on, on teeth. And so he was doing the first microbiome. Now we're looking at guts and everything else, but he was actually really trying to see what was making this plaque on your teeth. And he developed this microscope and was able to see microorganisms even though he didn't know what they were and associate them with the plaque. So what are these animolecules? So here we're fast forwarding to today where we have these um, electron microscope images and if you looked in a very fancy electron microscope um, you might see these different microorganisms and I ask you can you tell who they are or even who's most closely related to each other? based on these pictures. Any ideas? E. coli. E. coli you think is one of them? Sure. Which one? Lower right. Why? I have no idea. You're right. I don't know how you knew that, but that's awesome. Okay, so it turns out that Salmonella and E. coli are actually the most related, but you'd never know that. Even at the resolution of an electron microscope, you couldn't tell that. They don't have features that really tell you who's the same and who's different, right? Because they're tiny and because they don't have beautiful flowers, leaves, beaks, all these other things that people have been using to identify and classify organisms for hundreds of years. So microbes have been in this black box not understanding what they are for a long, long time. So what I'm going to try to do is take you through this, quickly take you through this time um, and tell you that it was a really long time that we didn't understand what microbes are and how they relate to evolution of life. But sequencing is what revolutionized that, um, that understanding and is now telling us how they evolve, which is what we're working on and I'll tell you about that at the end. Okay, so you already talked about Linnaeus. So he studied plants and he used the characteristics of those plants, like flower, you know, leaves, things like that, where they grow, to understand how things were related to each other. Again, we don't have those characters in microbes. Going forward, there was this idea of a tree of life starting to come around. And where are the microbes on this picture? Right here at the very bottom, Monera. We have no idea, but they're simple, single cells, so they must have been first. We, of course, man, is at the very top, the highest, the most evolved um, organism on, on the planet, and everything else is coming from that, okay? So even now, now we're fast forwarding 1921, we still have this description of um, microorganisms that's not really clear where they go, but for a while they were in plants. So for minute, uh, one-celled, chlorophyll-free, colorless, you know, these basically these descriptions, and they're kind of being put in kind of plant-like things, but they didn't really know at all what they are. Berge's manual is the taxonomy manual that has been for a long time. And here's what they said about what microorganisms are in 1923 or 1928. A review of the literature will show that the most popular term um, that has been used to describe systematic bacteriology is chaos. Uh, this is irrespective of the period of history under consideration. So you just don't know. You don't know who's related to who how they evolved anything about them because there's nothing to go on. 
Around this time, microbiology kind of took a turn for what I think is a turn for the worse, and that people decided, well, they didn't really care. They're just going to, we can't really, we don't really care what they are or how we're related to them, but we really want to understand how they work. And so a lot of microbiology went towards using um, microorganisms as cells to study. They started to be able to do genetic manipulations in laboratories, and uh, Cliver took it in this direction by noticing that the way they work is a lot like the way we work in terms of things like replication, um, you know, the way the central dogma of you know DNA to RNA to proteins okay so we can understand how those processes work by using microorganisms that grow quickly they're kind of just something we can use in the lab and that kind of went forward so he called them that he noticed this biochemical unity and didn't care so much about how they were different from each other they're just kind of these bags of enzymes that we can use to study how these processes work some people still cared though, and this is the microbial world. Any good biologist finds it intellectually distressing to devote his life to the study of a group that cannot readily or satisfactorily be defined in biological terms. So it's a scandal. We don't really know what this concept of a bacterium is. And so Stanier and Van Neel tried to put forth an, uh, um, an evolutionary explanation, sort of, which in 1962, um, which is defining the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes. So the, again, from microscopy, one of the things they noticed is that uh, the, the bacteria that they looked at don't have a nucleus. They're tiny single-celled organisms. They don't have a nucleus. We do, so that must be be really important. So we have membrane-bound nucleus, they divide by um, mitosis, they have a cytoskeleton, mitochondria and chloroplasts, these are all things that, that eukaryotes have, that we have, plants have. Um, and then there's everything else which doesn't have those things. So they're not defined by any particular feature, but just the fact that they don't have what we have. They don't have what the things that we understand have. So there's the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. And that's the best that they could do um, even, even here in the microbial, when they're writing the microbial world. The evolutionary literature still has, at this time, still has Monera at the bottom in this kind of ambiguous basal position. Um, bacteria are now listed there. Um, and then you have protista. And then again, at the top, the animals, uh, the fungi, and the plants. So how are we going to solve this problem? Yeah. So I was just curious. I mean, OK, so this is 69. Um, and so antibiotics have been out for 25 years. So did they even really know what they were killing? Yeah, I mean, the bacteria. But things they, they didn't know, like, without it well i mean they could grow them at this point the cliver and those that school had done a lot of work they could grow them in the lab they could isolate single colonies they could transfer them they had learned a lot about disease right because they had Coax, I took that part out because I didn't think I'd have much time, but a lot of it developed from, you know, Koch's postulates and all that stuff was already out, already figured out. So they knew that they were bad, and some people were starting to figure out that they were also good because they'd looked at soil and stuff, but they didn't know how they were related to everything else or what they really were or who was related to each other. So you wouldn't have looked, you would have said, okay, this antibiotic kills this microorganism, this bacterium. Does it kill this other guy? No, so they must not be related. <coughs> but you don't know how, you know, you can't predict based on anything you know about it whether or not that antibiotic is going to, so it's just em empirical. Mm -hmm. were, they, were they able to have like a pretty good working um, species set at least? No. Or They did some based on shape, and that, that only takes you so far. I mean, these guys are really different. The pictures I showed you, they all have the same shape. So it doesn't take you very far. Um, there's some that you can tell and some that you can't. They have different features like flagella. And, but now we know that those things change really fast. And so it probably isn't a good species um, designation. But there were stains, too, like gram stains and things that will show you some things will stain differently than other things. Um, but they weren't necessarily based on any kind of evolutionary perspective or model. OK, so what do we do? What do we do? We, we have no features. And so um, 
around this time, actually this is before, the, um, before DNA was used, but they were starting to think about actually using proteins to study molecular evolution. So Zuckerlin and Pauling in this paper in 1965 um, use um, protein molecules, protein sequences, um, which they could get by taking the proteins and, and um, cutting them into small pieces and then identifying which amino acids were there. It was a really tough process to sequence. Um, but they realized that these could be used to track evolutionary history. Now we have something that every, every organism has a feature that doesn't depend on morphology that we can use to trace the history of life. And here's how it works now. This is, not, again, not what they were using, but now we use sequence, and you just heard that talk. And I just wanted to remind you of how this can be used as molecular fossils. So you have your root sequence, um, and then that sequence gets random mutations, right? And those mu mutations are probably ch not changing amino acids. They're probably neutral. It doesn't matter to the, to the organism that has that, but it tells you a, a record. It encodes a record. It has a code that is in the genome. So here you have a C and a, oh sorry, I highlighted these. So here you have a C and a G at those particular positions. As, as this guy divides, it got maybe two mutations. Maybe this is many, many years down the line. And then this one gets another, each one of these get another two mutations, but they contain the record of that old mutation in their, in their genome. So you're creating a record of mutations that can then be used to map back. So that's the idea that Zuckerlin and Pauling had on how you can use molecules to trace molecular evolution as fossils. Okay, so to trace relationships between all organisms using molecular fossils, you need the sequence of a molecule that we all have. You guys know what that was, right? Hmm? What'd you say? Now, do we all have mitochondrial DNA? Bacteria don't have mitochondria, right? Because they're prokaryotes. Their eukaryotes have mitochondria. Ribosomal, yeah. So here's what, what Woese thought about this. He, look, he read that paper, so Carl Woese here at the University of Illinois, and he um, wrote this letter to Crick, which says, okay, we need to use something that everybody has. And what he came up with to use was ribosomal RNA. Everybody has ribosomal RNA. All cellular um, organisms have ribosomes because they all do this DNA to RNA to proteins, right? They need the ribosome. Um, of course, he didn't have this beautiful structure, but um, what it ends up to be is the 16 and the 23S ribosomal RNA. The other reason he decided to go with this is because there's a lot of it in every cell. So if you're, using, if you're using your ribosomes for translation, if you're an active cell, there's a lot of RNA in the cell. And so he was able to actually look at that RNA. Um, he wasn't looking at DNA, he was looking at RNA, and he chose to look at the 16S ribosomal RNA. So his idea was, okay, we'll use these molecular fossils. Instead of using hemoglobin, which other people were using, we'll use something that everybody has to have, ribosomal RNA, um, and we'll try to tra track the history of life on Earth. So. He decides to use the, um, the translation machinery, ribosomal RNA, um, and follow its own history. And that would have distinguished the bacteria from the eukaryotes. But he was able to make an additional discovery of the third domain of life because he was here at the University of Illinois where this um, uh, emeritus faculty member also was, Ralph Wolf. So he was working, Ralph Wolf was working on isolating new organisms from new habitats and he went to the um, agricultural um, uh, farms here and took cow rumen and isolated an anaerobe that lived there and when he looked at it under the microscope and when he looked at it biochemically he said this thing is really different than anything else I've ever seen and he didn't know what it was but he found out that Carl Woese was um, was uh, 
was trying to figure out what things were using molecules. And so the story goes that he literally walked down the hall, gave this to Carl Woese and said, you should check this guy out. It's really, it's really different than anything I've ever seen. I wonder what it is. And so Carl Woese put that into his libraries. He was making of ribosomal RNA. Um, they used to celebrate with a beer at Tim Pony's um, the day that that happened uh, before Carl Woese's death. And, and uh, Ralph Wolf is still um, active, has a little lab space in the, at the University of Illinois in the microbiology department. Okay, so using that, um, that anaerobe, that methanogen, uh, methanogen and comparing its ribosomal RNA to the other ones that he had, he was able to identify um, the, uh, uh, f the phylogenetic structure of the prokaryotic domain um, and it ends up to be that prokaryotes don't really mean anything because there are three domains of life, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes. So he originally was using these methanogens that are here that ended up to be archaea. He compared them to yeast and to um, human ribosomal RNA and found out that the uh, archaea and eukaryotes are more closely related to each other than either one is to bacteria, that there's actually these three domains of life. And that was the big change. It also tells us, right, that there's, that there's something, this lets us trace the relationships between organisms. Now we have an evolutionary history that puts microbes on that map. We have a characteristic that we can use to define who they are and see how closely related they are. And it traces back to what must have been the last universal common ancestor. And we still don't really know what happened down here at the base of this tree, um, but that's what we're working on in the astrobiology institute that we have here uh, upstairs at the IGB. Okay, so now we're gonna go forward. So we're gonna go forward from WOS, and you guys are gonna uh, be talking more about that, the Woese, um, Woesean revolution in the next unit. Um, but as you guys all probably know, uh, PCR was revolutionizing our ability to look at particular genes. And so he ne no longer had to look at ribosomal RNA. He could now use PCR to amplify DNA and look at ribosomal RNA genes. I guess I'm gonna assume you guys all understand how PCR works. You can design primers to amplify a specific gene out of a mass of DNA, right? And so um, here's a, an example of how you might do that, um, which isn't as important as to this talk as the, as the point that this man, uh, Norm Pace, um, who also worked here at the University of Illinois, um, began, he had this idea that you could use PCR to amplify um, ribosomal RNA from anywhere that you wanted, not just from cultures. And you could compare the sequences that you got from those amplicons to that map of cultured organisms that Carl Woese had already made. And so this is the way he thought, well, maybe we can see what's out there that we can't actually grow in the lab so we can have a better understanding of the diversity of microbes that are out there. So he used this, he originally used this technique where you PCR amplify 16S ribosomal DNA from any environment and then clone and sequence, and he was using Sanger sequence um, to sequence each of those individual amplicons. So now each of these should relate back to a single organism that was in that environment. And then you sequence them and put them on the map. This is shotgun sequencing. It's called shotgun sequencing, and it's the way that um, Craig Venter did the human genome that allowed him to do it faster. Right, the, 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 um, the NIH uh, group was trying to walk through the genome by looking at each chromosome, and Craig Venter said, let's just shotgun sequence the whole thing and then put it back together. Um, so this is kind of the same thing, although this is looking at amplicon sequences. Okay, and so what he found is this tree, and it's, this is way out of date now, this is from 1997, but you basically can't make a tree of all the sequences we have now because there's just way, way, way too many. And he found out, Norm Pace found out, that greater than 99% of the microbes um, in the, are, are not in culture. So okay, what we thought we knew about microorganisms, really we don't know anything because only 1% of those are in culture. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that they can't be cultured, but they haven't been yet. So people have argued whether they can be cultured. Probably some can and some can't. But the point is here that there's just a lot more than we ever thought there were. But they all have the, this ribosomal RNA gene that we can map. Now, if they didn't, then they wouldn't be amplified by these primers. So we wouldn't know they were there. And so people wonder if maybe there's other domains that we can't see because we haven't been able to amplify 16S. Okay, so what he does is he takes soil, fecal matter, you know, hot spring, whatever you want, extract DNA from that, all DNA from that, and then use these primers to amplify the ribosomal RNA gene out of it. And that being able to amplify the ribosomal RNA gene out of it allows you to look just at that gene. And then you take each of those separate pieces and sequence those and map it onto the diversity. How did he pick the sample population? Huh? How did he pick the sample population? He, so he, just, he started what he called the search. So he went out and he was just trying everything. He was trying you know, anywhere, anywhere you want. And he was mostly not focusing on human stuff at that point because he was interested in, you know, the evolution of early life and they thought that that was in hot springs and so he was kind of more interested in sampling un, un, you know, unrecognized organisms. And then there was a long span of time where it was just, for, you know, everybody was sequencing everything and every time you find something new. About how big is the uh, ribosome RNA gene, and, and did it take a long time? Because it sounds like they were sequencing a ton of stuff. Did it take a long time to sequence? Stuff? Yeah, so it's a, it was it's fourteen. It's almost um, fifteen kb. So it's um, and it doesn't take very long at all. At the, I was sort of doing a rotation in his lab when he was really doing the search. They were doing the slabs slab gels, which are, you're running your own gels on Sanger sequence, and you could do 96 in a few hours. So it's short, and you can get across most of it, or enough of it to, to identify using the map. So when you guys were doing that work, did you actually sequence all four base pairs, or did you just go for one to focus the sequence? At this point, it was big dye terminator, so you could do, oh, okay. yeah, you could do them all, all four at once. Any other questions? Okay, so wow, there's like only one, we only know 1% of the microorganisms there. That was a big deal. It was based on the technology that, that Carl Woese had had this idea of looking at these signatures in the, um, in the it, using ribosomal RNA to have these signatures. And the three domains held up when he did this as well, for the most part. So we still have these three domains. And it also makes us now feel small, right? Because we're here, you are here, and this is the rest of diversity on the planet. And so we are just a teeny tiny piece of what is out there in terms of genetic diversity. And this is plants and animals and fungi. So all of that, all of those eukaryotes that we think about a lot and know a lot about their evolution are here and everything else is in this um, kind of unseen um, majority. And it's also not a ladder anymore, right? So it's not like the, the little tiny um, monera at the bottom and then the higher organisms at the top. This is sampling all current organisms, right? Nothing is more evolved than anything else. This is all from organisms that you got from the soil or whatever. So we don't have this kind of ladder of evolution anymore. Okay. So how does this diversity evolve? We now know that, we now know how to identify who organisms are. And that was a big, big piece of understanding the map of evolution, uh, the evolution of life in terms of deep evolution since the beginning of life on Earth. But how do they evolve? How is, what's the mechanisms through which they evolve? And that might be different for bacteria and archaea than it is for the plants and animals that we've studied for a long time. The question of species might be different, for example, in these organisms. 
So the way we're going to figure out how they evolve is again to use genomics. So there's a lot of other ways of, of looking at evolution, but we still have to go back to genomes as our, our molecules as our markers again, because you can't really see anything changing in the, um, in the microorganisms because they're so small. So here's Craig Venter. He's the guy that did this uh, shotgun sequencing of the human genome. It is his genome. It is his dog that are sequenced um, in the human, were the first ones that were sequenced in the human genome. He is now sequencing the ocean. So he goes out and just takes DNA out of different places in the ocean off of his sailboat and sequences all the DNA and deposits it in a database and crashes the database with the amount of new sequences that he gets. He thinks a lot of himself. But he's published the first um, bacterial genome using the shotgun sequence method that he ended up using later on the human genome in 1995. Soon after that came the first archaeal genome in 1996 and you can see Gary Olson and Carl Woese, both of whom live, uh, were working here at the University of Illinois, were on this genome. It's another methanogen, but this time it's a methanogen, Methanococcus unasii, that was um, pulled out of the deep hydrothermal vents. Because now that we knew how to look for microorganisms, people were going all over the world looking for new ones. Um, and this is one of the ones they found. It's a very interesting archaeon. Okay, so, yeah. So there's, so there's a lot, um, there's, so for a while, actually, and there still is a lot of bioprospecting going on. So people are going all over the world, taking samples, sequencing them to find new enzymes. So they found that TAC polymerase from Thermus aquaticus from Yellowstone National Park. That was a billion dollar industry that was, that was patented. It was. No, Yellowstone did not get that money, and now you have to go through crazy permitting to get um, in, to get to sample in Yellowstone. Um, but people are bioprospecting everywhere. I mean, people are are now looking for cellulases, for example, that break down um, that break down you know cell walls so that you can make biofilms. There's, I mean, biofuels. There's all there's all kinds of bioprospecting that's still going on, and to my knowledge, you it goes back to the person that sequences it and identifying it, identifies it. Of course, it doesn't go back to where the sample came from or the microorganism at all. Okay, so now there's been, st recently there's been started this uh, uh, genomic Encyclopedia of Bacteria and Archaea um, that was trying to sample the diversity of microorganisms either that we had in culture or that we could pull out of these metagenome sequences by just sequencing everything in the environment. Um, sorry, this picture didn't come out very well, but it shows you the bacteria. You can resolve different groups of bacteria the, when you sequence the whole genome and take genes that they share besides ribosomal RNA out, you make a tree that's still resolves the three domains of life. So that seems like it's very, very real. It did not depend just on that single molecule that they use. The more genomes that we sequence, um, the more we find that, that that tree is still, we still see it for the most part with genes that they all share. But not every gene shows the same the same relationships and that's going to be a problem that I'll talk about in a minute. But so here's the um, number of complete genomes and there's many, many, many more incomplete genomes because it takes a lot to finish a genome and have every nucleotide in the right place and have it completely closed and everything. So this is just the number that are done. Um, there's a lot, lot, lot more that aren't. So you'll see bacteria are, has the highest number and archaea are on the scale of eukaryotes and I'm not really sure why that is. It's not that there's fewer of, the, of archaea. Um, than bacteria. They both have small genomes. Eukaryotes tend to have bigger, bigger genomes and, and um, so they, that might be one of the reasons, but not all eukaryotic genomes are that big. So I think it's a distribution that's mostly driven by trying to look at the genomes of pathogens and the guys that we have in culture, which are mostly bacteria. So they have a range in, in uh, sizes of genomes. 
and um, ours is the biggest, so where we're going to be sequent, where you're going to take a thousand dollars now as a big feat, we, you know, you can sequence a hundred or more bacterial genomes because they're so much smaller, and so you're just the number of the amount of um, coverage for each genome. Um, allows you to sequence many different genomes on one of those single Illumina runs that, that Chris was telling you about. Um, but there's a big range in genome sizes, um, and you can see human mitochondria. I forgot to point out on, the, on that big tree that mitochondria we talked about earlier are actually bacteria, as you guys probably know from this um, endosymbiotic um, hypothesis. And the sequencing the ribosomal RNA that they maintain shows this, because so they map right in um, with the bacteria. So do the chloroplasts map, map in with the cyanobacteria. Um, and so these guys that are, are obligate pathogens or symbionts tend to have smaller genomes because they're basically <laughs> offloading all of the extra stuff that they have that they need to live out in the environment. Um, and so that's been one of the things that looking just at genomes has shown us is a little bit about how these genomes evolve, not just who they are, but how they evolve. These guys that are living within organisms are able to delete genes and it doesn't matter, right? And so deletion is a big part of evolution of these organisms. Okay. And then also here is Mycoplasma mycoides. It is the first synthetic genome. Guess who did it? Craig Venter, right? So he made, he took um, uh, mycoplasma and synthesized a genome and put it in the mycoplasma and he was able to get that cell to grow. So it's the first synthetic genome of a, of a free living organism. Okay, so the mechanisms of evolution are recorded in the footprints of the genome. It's not just who they are, but how they evolve that we can get to now by looking at genome sequences. Because we have more than just this one single gene, we can look at the whole genome and how it evolves. And that's um, what we're interested in. So we line up genomes. Uh, I look at the same species of bacteria because I like to look, or archaea, because I like to see the mechanisms happening as they occur. So you have to have things that are really close because they haven't had all this time for a lot of different events to happen. And then you notice the differences between them. So here's an example of Staphylococcus. You guys are probably familiar with uh, Staph aureus, MRSA. Um, so this is a, an example of eight Staphylococcus strains. Um, each one of these rings is a different genome of a different Staphylococcus that's from the isolate. And if there's a colored line here, it means that gene was present. And if there's not a colored line there, it means it's absent. And so you can look at this map and see who has which genes compared to each other. And you can see there's some places where, for example, this red strain here has a segment of DNA in its genome that's not in anybody else. And um, these guys have a segment of DNA that's present only in this one, and these guys don't have it. Is it just from the bacterial DNA, or, also, or I've heard that there's also plasmids? Is that? Good, great question. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. So the, one of the things that we find out is that there's plasmids moving around. Okay. So, Angela, this might just be about my bad eyes, but on the white um, line, so going out. Yeah. Okay, so this is compared to the, yes, there are some that are, it's templated on one strain. It's templated on one strain, which is on this outside. So if there's a line going all the way in, it's something that this outside guy had and none of these other guys have. And of course, that would happen if you used anybody else as a template and you're not seeing the things um, that this outer strain doesn't have, right? But the point is that there's islands of genes, they're called, that are present in some strains but not others. In that outer strain, how did you that It was the first one that they did. Um, I, my eyesight is bad as well. Like Sorry, it's not such those, a good picture. Are those different colors, are those all a lot of dashes really close together? Yeah. Are they base pairs? Yeah, they're a lot, no, they're genes. Okay. They're genes, yep. 
So this is looking at the whole genome, bacteria and archaea mostly, but not all have circular genomes. And then you take all the ba base pairs, you call all the different genes using an annotation tool in computer, and that's what these are. And then this tells you if that strain has it or that gene or not. I see seven distinct colors, and then you've got that sort of mostly blank one this is this reference around the outside. Yeah, these three guys are actually the reference. So it's one strand and the other strand. Okay. And I'm not sure what this is highlighting. Sometimes they put transposons or something like that on the next one. So sorry, these three are that reference, and then these are the other ones. And those first three lines on the outside are all one organism. Right. Yeah. So um, you may get to this later, but how do you, like, you know, as they were like sequencing all these different cool bacteria and archaea that are coming along, how do they say for sure this is a new species or a new genus versus a strain of something? We don't know how to do that yet. We really don't. And there's a, it's very controversial and people are, are, again, just like when we didn't know how to classify bacteria, people are throwing up their hands and saying, I don't really care what a species is anymore because I know its genome. But I mean, of course it matters, right? Because if a species defines the, um, the genes that you have access to through recombination, then you want to know what that gene pool is. We don't have a good definition of species. We just don't. Not yet. We're working on it. Is everybody? Am I out of time? Okay. Okay, so here's another example. Um, I don't know if you guys will remember this. My MCB 300 students don't, um, which is a little <laughs> upsetting to me. But um, so in 1993, four kids died and hundreds of others got sick from this Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak. There's been many since then, right? So they sequenced the, um, e the E. coli strain that was present in that Jack in the Box um, 0157H7, um, and they compared it to the lab strain, and they found that this guy, the E. coli strain, has 25% um, more genetic material than that lab strain. So it has 25% of its genome that the other, the guy that we work with that we call E. coli doesn't have. And one of the islands of genes that it doesn't have encodes the function that makes E. coli, this version of E. coli, a pathogen. So these islands are coming and going and they're changing the physiology and the pathogenicity of the organisms. So is there really such a thing as the average E. coli, the average staphylococcus? So there's this, I took these slides out, but there's this idea of a pan genome. So the idea that people are working with now is that there's a backbone that's the core genome that defines E. coli or sulfalobus or any organism that you're staphylococcus, any organism that you're working on. And then there's this variable genome, and people have other words for this, but it's a part of the genome that's coming and going. And um, we don't really know what the evolutionary rules are about what defines what can come and go, right? So I guess people would call E. coli that core genome, but then it has access to these other genes, and we don't know how that access is defined. And that's one of the things we need to figure out if we're really going to be able to understand how these guys are evolving. So islands have been found now, and they're flexible components, variable components. People call them dispensable, depending on whether you can identify a function. But basically, they're in every organism. There's no, we sequenced two clones out of 12 that we sequenced because I wanted to see something that was the same. There's almost never do you find the same thing? And it's up to 25% of the genome that's different. So there's a lot of these islands. And they encode toxicity, pathogenicity, um, antibiotic resistance, symbiosis. All of these functions that we care a lot about are riding around on this flexible genome, variable genome. You do the term island because they're metabolically Island because they stand out as their own island in the sea of the genome. So the core genome lines right up, and then you have this other piece that's stuck in there, and that's why they call them a, an island. Yeah. So when do you call them islands 
There is not yet a cutoff. That's one of the things we're trying to figure out because we don't know these rules. Where do they come from? How do they move around? And what are the rules that define where they go, if there's any? So for a while, people said, OK, we need to take apart this entire tree, because the tree of life, because genes are moving around so much that there are no evolutionary rules. It's just one big pan organism. Then they figured out, well, no, actually, there is an E. coli core genome. There is a Staphylococcus core genome. But we're not, we, haven't, we don't have enough sequences yet to really say which pieces are which. I think as we get more, we'll figure that out. So you can find, sometimes you can find these islands in different strains. So they move in and they move out. Of even species? We, yeah. And you can find them between species. So antibiotic resistance are moving between species. And they're moving on plasmids um, a lot of times. And so, how, but again, we don't know the rules about how they move around and um, wh where barriers to entry of those uh, um, islands are. Have you left out, I, I maybe open another bag of tricks, but have you left open the possibility that it's just completely random and there ain't nothing you can do about it? That, that it's just a big mess or that these islands coming and going are completely random? Yeah. Islands, I think people really do think they're kind of random. And for, I think there's probably evolutionary rules. I think that selection is working on these types of mutations the same way it's working on mutations that we get in our genomes that we understand better. I think we just don't understand the rules. And there might not be any rules for some and rules for others. Oh yeah, that's what's that's what's happening. So there's now there's thousands of uh, you know there's at least hundreds of E. coli strains, and there's the ones that are associated with different diseases, different habitats, and people are looking at how the genes are different between those. Now, the, comparing it to the lab strain is a problem for the same reason that looking at a pathogen or an obligate symbiont is a problem. It's been living in the lab. It's been living off of us for a long time, so it's offloaded a lot of its of what it has, right? But that, that one island that, that caused pathogenicity in E. coli is something that only that strain had. And now they've found it in other strains as well. So if you look at the, I mean, like you hear of the, the H1, 1, 5, 7, 1, whatever the order is, um, outbreaks a lot now, actually. It's scary. Yep. Do people then sequence and look to see how similar yes. those Yes. Is that, yeah, exactly. There's selective pressure on that. So the guys that are going to cause that disease probably have that island, right? Because they are able, they have that capacity in their genome. And, you know, for example, people are using it in forensics. I know you had a lecture on forensics, so I also took this out, but when there was the anthrax, um, there was the anthrax scare. They went and they sequenced all the genomes that they found of all the strains and were able to track it back to the AIM strain by using SNPs, not even differences in gene contact and gene, gene content um, that were in the genome. And we maintain the genome facility that we have in the U.S. so that we can do that. If we have an outbreak or if we have an attack, we can sequence the genomes and find out where it comes from. Right. I'm kind of interested in the proteins that are doing the cutting and pasting. Would that go anywhere, or are these just totally common proteins? I and mean, what's really interested is that these genes that are moving are staying together as they move, and that's why the focus is on the islands. I'm just, I mean, is no, this absolutely. So that's the idea of where do they come from and how do they move, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. I'm so researching proteins doing the actual. Yes. And sometimes you can find those in the islands. Like here there's an integrase. It's on that island. Is 
So that island came in and it brought with it the mechanism that brought it in. Others don't have that. Yes, it is. It, it is. So that's the that's kind of the punchline that I'm. That's the punchline that I'm gonna come to um, at the end. But yeah, these are these are organisms of their own, right? We just don't have them in our three domain tree. So if we understand how they evolve and how their interactions with their hosts, being the bacteria, evolve, we might be able to get to these evolutionary rules. That's exactly where I'm gonna go w here. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Exactly. It happens all the time. In, in nature, it's going on constantly. And selection then for the, we do the selection and genetic modification for the trait we want, but this is selection for antibiotic resistance, which is a pretty strong selection, so it's going to only be those guys that survive. Yeah. What's the definition then? Of, of an organism? So they're not cellular, right? But they have, they replicate. Plasmids and viruses replicate, right? And so there's, and there's selection for higher fitness in terms of how much they replicate. So that's natural selection on that organism or on that genome of that creature. They depend on their host for replication. So those guys are not alive because they depend on their host. So I guess that these bacteria that are obligate symbionts that have lost their machinery for replication and things like that or lost their ability to be free living are also not organisms? I don't know. I mean, it, it, they're obligate. Right now, we think that viruses, is there any virus that can replicate by itself? So we think that viruses depend on their host, their obligate symbionts for their replication. So I think that's where people are drawing the line right now. And I usually make the difference between cellular organisms that can replicate on their own and these other genetic elements that you know, probably have evolutionary rules. And those rules may be the same as for other organisms. And the island would also be classified in viruses and so they are this mobile genetic elements. You know, some of them are plasmids, some of them ride on plasmids, some of them are viruses. The difference between plasmids and viruses is really ambiguous. It's not a very fine, you know, clearly defined difference. Both of them depend on their hosts. Plasmids don't depend, don't make their own um, capsule that they go out um, into the world with, but they both have integrate into the genome, can integrate into the genome, and move genetic material around. OK. I think, that, I think I've basically gotten through this. Um, you guys are awesome, because I basically set it up the big question and you answered it. But um, so I, I wanted to look at this. And so I am um, doing this in, in my lab. We, we take this approach, which all comes back to genomics, which is why this is appropriate, I think, for this um, session, but um, so we're looking at how these guys are, ha are evolving in their natural environment to try to understand these rules. Okay, and we went into this not really thinking about mobile genetic elements, but just trying to go back, this was a while ago, trying to understand how these genomes are evolving and how are they evolving. We decided to look at Sophilobus islandicus, which is a hyperthermophilic crenarchaea that lives in hot springs like the one you see there. And, um, we chose to look at these organisms because their environments are constrained. You can identify a population, and we wanted to understand how they were evolving in, in real time, so we needed to understand where they lived and, and what was changing in their environment. So this is the geochemist that we've, um, we've, uh, we've teamed up with, sampling the geochemistry of this hot spring at the same time as we're sampling the microbiology and we're trying to understand how changes in the environment basically affect the changes in the genome. We're ultimately going for the Drosophila of the archaea, so a genetic organism that we can work with in the lab, that we can understand natural variation. The good thing about Drosophila is that we know a lot about genetic variation in this organism, but we don't know a lot about genetic variation in most microbes.
And we, again, we chose it because we thought it would live in island populations, and island populations are one of the things that evolutionary biologists like because they're constrained. You know, they can, you can really link it to its environment all the way from the Galapagos Islands and now to these, um, these hot springs that we work on. This is one from Laston National Park, and this one's in Russia. And we've gone there to sample Sophilobus and then compare them to each other. So if you guys, if your goal is to make it like the Drosophila of the Archaea, um, that would require you to bring it back to the lab, right? Do you keep yeah. it under the same constraints? We, because I would imagine the minute you don't have those same constraints, it starts to evolve on you. Yeah, that's a, I mean, so that's a brilliant question because most microbiologists don't think of it. And yes, we do bring it back to the lab, and yes, we do put it in culture, and we try not to, uh, we isolate colonies, and each time they grow up, there's a generation that's being selected for. We try to not keep a continuous culture, basically. We go back to that original culture. So we estimate they've been out of the lab for something like 10 generations, maybe 100 generations at most by the time we freeze them down. So they're pretty wild still, versus E. coli, which has been transferred through the labs for, you know, for a long, 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 long time, and who knows how it's been selected for and changed. So they're pretty wild. But they're not, it's not a, you know, it's, it's definitely not the same habitat as they're living in. All right. So we go out, we sample. This is us sampling. We looked at, um, major three major populations that we could find and we sequenced their genomes this is a little bit fast forwarding on our story but um, and actually this is where Chris Fields who just talked came in because um, we when I started my lab here almost eight years ago we had um, we had genome sequence, but we didn't really know what to do with it. We wanted to know how they evolved. We were comparing them, and Chris actually um, contacted me and said, I hear you have genome sequence. I'm working in an in a, um, RNA lab right now, but I'm really interested in bioinformatics. Can I just moonlight in your lab and t help you analyze these? And I said, sure. So he came and helped us figure this out. Um, so what we did was we compared genomes from three different locations, two from Lassen, two from Yellowstone, and three from Kamchatka, and we wanted to just see what's different between them. And it, are there things that are more similar in the Lassen strains that make them Lassen strains than the strains that are from Yellowstone that make them Yellowstone strains? And so that's what we wanted to do. And we found, and so these are again these genomes, and this time this map on the outer ring has the dark, the light gray is genes that they all share, and the dark gray is genes that are variable between them. So there was a lot of variation between the genomes and we were able to map that back to ga gene gain and gene loss. And what do you think was the major differences in what we found? So we found these islands, right? And we didn't know what they were and we looked and looked and looked, and now we're interested in understanding viruses. They don't go on the tree of life, but they're present in all our genomes. All of the genomes that we've pulled out of the wild, no matter where we go, have viruses in them. And those viruses encode genes that we have no idea what they do or why they're there. And so now we've had to expand our thinking to try to include viruses, even though they don't all have ribosomal RNA, they don't all share anything that can allow us to map them onto this tree of life. So just like the microbial biology was before, virology is kind of in this black, black box zone of not really understanding how they're related to each other. But everything gets infected by viruses, bacteria, um, archaea and eukaryotes get infected by viruses and so um, we need to understand these, right? Because they're carrying new genes into our genomes just like they're carrying new genes into eukaryotic genomes and bacterial genomes like for antibiotic resistance. And so my lab has started to work on virus-host interactions, trying again to get to these evolutionary rules. When do they integrate? When are they selected for? Um, when do they infect? And um, other people besides us have tracked down lots of weird viruses that infect uh, the organisms we work on. They're very different. So we work on Krenarchaea. They're very different from any viruses that we know. 
they're very different. They have very different morphologies. Um, and each time somebody finds one, it's a new paper that describes a new virus. Um, and there's just, there's many, many, many of them out there to be described. Okay, so this is now getting to Maria's work, and this is Maria's slide. She's a graduate student in my lab who started to figure out, well, we should try to define these interactions. Okay, we're gonna take one virus and one host and try to understand the rules that, uh, that define its um, that define, uh, define its evolution. Actually, we have variation in this virus that we've taken from these different populations. We have variation in hosts, so we can try to understand how these rules are evolving. And um, she's already described many different ways that these hosts interact with viruses. So though a virus infection can result in resistance or it can result in infection. Infection can result in death which is what we usually think of for phage or bacterial viruses, but it can also result in chronic infection, which is like maybe integrating into the genome as an island, maybe just being maintained in the host sometimes, and the one we work on is still making viruses even though it has this infection. And then there's this new way that they can interact, which is immunity, and I'm not gonna go into this, but it's fantastic um, why people started to study viruses, we realized that, the, that bacteria and archaea have an adaptive immune system encoded in their genomes and it allows them to recognize and eliminate infections of these genetic elements. So if we're trying to understand the evolutionary rules, we have to understand these interactions. These interactions are defined by resistance, but they're also defined by immunity. And the good thing about this is that the way it works is to take a small piece of the virus and put it into the genome and so we can actually track the evolutionary history of these interactions because it's encoded in the genome, um, in the immune system of, of these guys. And so we're working on this system. This system has been um, a really big deal because it's led to us being able to engineer he the human genome. So you've probably heard about it recently. Okay, so what we've learned, we've learned that viruses are pretty specific to local hosts and even within the local environment, there's variation in who they can affect. Resistance is rare, but immunity is high in these organisms. So that's one of the, one of the ways that they're interacting that's gonna be important. Um, the immune profiles are diverse and they're that diversity is maintained over time. So there isn't immunodominance of one immune type. There's a diversity and that's gonna play a lot into the evolution of the virus. Um, some viruses kill sulfalobus, but other viruses are good for sulfalobus. So we found that if you get infected chronically with a virus, we think that you can use it as a weapon against other uh, competing cells. So you can increase your own fitness by killing off the other guys that are infectable by this virus. And then Maria's um, just finishing up a paper, hopefully today or tomorrow, that shows that CRISPR immunity comes at a cost to the cell relative to resistance. We're working on modeling how that affects their evolution. Okay, so this is my lab a while ago, but there's a lot of people that have done the work and we've been funded the whole time by um, NSF, both NSF and, and NASA.